And with that, I will now introduce Laura Jones, our Executive Vice President and Chief Strategic Officer. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Alexa. And I'm going to ask my co-webinar, the gang's all here today. Corinne, Brendan, Rachel, we're all here. So I'm going to ask everyone to join me on the screen for I promised you a holiday edition. And a big thank you to Ryan from the Costume Shop in Calgary for helping uh, make the holiday edition so festive and sending us these beautiful uh, fascinators and hats, uh, holiday hats. So here we are. And for those of you who may be joining us for the first time, um, we're not always this crazy, uh, but this is our 36th weekly webinar. And so we're going to have a few laughs today because we uh, it's heading into the holidays. Holiday edition, we've got our, our Santa ties I think Rachel you've got your Santa tie on and we're uh, we're really feeling uh, we're feeling uh, festive and ready to go so I'm Laura Jones I'm the executive uh, vice president of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business which really means uh, like a lot like like our members like business owners I wear a lot of different hats um, in my job and I work with the research team I work with the legislative team I work with our, our marketing and partnerships teams um, and one of the great things about working with CFIB is we all work really well together and you've probably got a little sense of that. Um, so I'm joined by some really, really capable colleagues here. Corinne, who's an expert in all things to do with Ottawa, which is a big job these days. And she wears a couple of other hats as well. Corinne, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, so hi, everybody. Uh, as Laura said, I oversee the Ottawa federal legislative work. I also work in the area of partnerships. So all the savings programs that we have are, are, are an area that I oversee. I also work a little bit on the provincial legislative side and certainly help out in things to do with marketing. So also a little bit of everything. And yes, thank you, Ryan. I wanted to do a shout out as well. Uh, we really appreciate the Christmas cheer that you sent. And uh, hopefully we can now share it with the rest of you and get everybody a little bit into the mood of Christmas if we can't, or the holidays, I should say. And, uh, so back to you, Laura. <laughs> Thanks, Brendan. We're also joined by both Brendan and Rachel today. So Brendan and Rachel are part of our business resources team. You sometimes hear us uh, slip into our, our lingo where we'll say BR, we mean business resources, basically the helpline, that's the plain language version of it. And so they take calls from across Canada. Uh, Brendan is based um, in British Columbia and Rachel is in Ontario, in Ottawa. Um, so um, do you two want to introduce yourselves? Yeah, absolutely. Very briefly. Thanks, Laura. I'm the manager of Western Canada Business Resources, so BC through Manitoba. Um, my crew, we answer calls, of course, across the day and any calls that you may have, any questions you may have, or even if you just need to chat and unload a little bit of your stress levels, give us a shout. I'll say it again. I'll say the number now, but we, we reiterate it again and again throughout the, the presentation. one 234 2232 I'm also going to be working behind the scenes today trying to answer some of your questions as you type them into us. Um, if you have follow-up questions, again, call that number. We're happy to help you anytime. Great. Okay. And Rachel, um, also another one of our capable, capable uh, team that helps answer his calls and works closely with Corinne. Um, and uh, you've been spending a lot of time with CRA lately, uh, Rachel, and I've been joining you on some of those really fun calls. So <laughs> maybe you can introduce yourself. Yeah, I am a coordinator for the National Affairs team. So what that means is I also work with Brendan and all the BR counselors to get them up to speed on, on what the COVID programs are uh, and how to answer your questions best. And then I also work with Corinne uh, in, in some meetings with CRA and Laura, of course, um, to, to try to get some answers for you guys when you bring them through the BR lines. Well, thanks everyone. And so together what we do on this webinar, as always, is we try and answer as many of your questions as possible. Also give you an update on what's new. Um, so hopefully this saves you some time. We're paying atten very close attention to what's going on across Canada so that uh, maybe you don't have to save you some time there. Our commitment is to keep our website up to date uh, and our, our FAQs there are come from you. They come from our surveys, they come from our helplines. So uh, we try to plain language our answers as well. So we take what we get from CRA and we work back and forth uh, with them to try and make it intelligible. So that's a place you can go if you need help. And on the next slide, we're, um, 
going to start with a few quotes. I this this time I picked some Christmas quotes that I liked. So I like this: "What is Christmas? Tenderness for the past, courage for the present, and hope for the future." Sort of captured something for me about what this time of year feels like. And um, also love this one about Hanukkah. The proper uh, response is Hanukkah teaches is not to curse the darkness, but to light a candle. That seemed very uh, appropriate for the times we're in. And blessed is the season that engages the whole world in a conspiracy of love. I think that. That's why everybody likes this time of year is that it does um, it does we do remember to be kind and and to remember to be grateful and of course for those of you who've been joining us since the beginning you know I'm a bit of a Churchill fan and even though this is not really that inspiring of a Churchill quote he's got many that are far better I couldn't resist putting Churchill on the on the slide so Christmas is a season not only for rejoicing but for reflection so a few thoughts as we get into some some of the content uh, today to hang on to as we wade through the government stuff. And we're going to go through what's new, um, some quick updates on SEBA, SUS, and SERS. These are the three main programs, of course, the loans, the wage subsidy, and the um, rent subsidy. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what's changing in 2021, a couple of tax updates, and then we'll get to as many of your questions as possible. And um, unfortunately, there's still some unanswered questions where we're going to have to say we've been working back and forth with CRA on, on some things where the answer is still I don't know, but at least we'll be clear about what we know and what we don't know. And so on the next slide, I think we're getting into what's new, and I'm going to bring Corinne up. I, I think that the, the the, the biggest new um, news that everybody's excited about is, of course, vaccines arriving and starting to be administered across Canada so that Rudolph and his girlfriend can uh, stop social distancing. And um, so we're, we're excited about that. And then I know that uh, I don't know that there's ever been such a collective excitement about saying goodbye to a year um, as there is around moving from 2020 to 2021, even though, you know, we still have a bit more of the storm to deal with in 2021. And of course, we have the cleanup and the recovery. Um, but I think uh, surviving 2020 is quite an accomplishment. And with that, Corinne, I'll turn it over to you to go through the, um, you know, some of the updates for the for the other uh, pr programs and what's new. And I'll be back when we get to the uh, rent subsidy. Yeah, great. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, and so another piece of actually pretty good news that came out this week um, is the CRA actually announced uh, a new temporary flat rate option for employees to claim home office expenses. So the whole sort of um, issue of home office expenses actually started coming up, as you can imagine, throughout the year. If you're someone who has uh, employees who maybe work in an office who now had to work from home for much of the year, there were a lot of questions around how CRA was going to manage that because in a normal year or prior to COVID, um, only a certain percentage of employees would be able to claim home office expenses if they're working for a company. Um, but of course, this year, almost everybody who works in an office probably had to work from home at some point or another. So rather than requiring all of this paperwork to go on between employers and employees, knowing that most employees probably had some experience working from home, um, we've been uh, lobbying hard for the government to simplify the process a lot more. Other groups did as well. And we were successful in that uh, CRA did announce this week a new sort of approach for this year only, for 2020 only, and that is to have a temporary flat rate option for employees. So how does that work? So employees who worked more than 50% of the time from home for a period of at least four consecutive weeks in 2020 can now claim $2 for each day they work from home due to COVID-19. The maximum they can claim is $400 under this temporary flat rate method. So that's 200 working days uh, per individual to sort of reach that mark. If there are two people in a home that work um, um, essentially as for a business that work from home, they each can claim it separately. But 400 is the max with that, what they call flat rate option. It can only be used for 2020. Um, this means that the employee does not have to calculate things like their workspace, the, the have any supporting documents, or get the form T2200 um, form signed by the employer. So that's where it's an advantage for employers who may have employees in this situation because that T2200 form, which is normally the form that would, the employer would sign to say that yes, this employee worked from home during this time, is not uh, required under this new flat rate option for this year. However, if the employee opts to do this, they cannot claim any other employment expenses uh, in this particular year. 
We go to the next slide though. There are other options. This isn't the only option. So next slide, thank you. So basically they can also opt to, so that's a flat rate method is the easiest. You get a set amount and it's done and over, no paperwork, no fuss. Uh, there's also though, if somebody wants to claim a bunch of office expenses, because maybe they feel they spent more than $400 working from home of their personal income, uh, they may want to do a more detailed method. And then what the CRA has done is they've taken the T2200 form, which is the normal form for this, and they've done a shortened version of it called the T2200S. This form employers will have to sign if their employees opt to do the more detailed version of this particular um, home office expense approach. Um, so basically, as you can see here, um, uh, it's it's a fairly simplified form. What they CRA is telling us is that they that the employer only has to basically answer three questions on that form and then basically certify it. They're also allowing electronic signatures this year between the uh, employer and the employee on that form. Again, only for this year, so that you don't have to have some face to face contact in order for that to happen. CRA created a, cal a calculator as well for employees to go there and figure out which option may work better for them, whether it's the flat rate option or the more detailed short form option. And finally, uh, and there's some links there for that as well. And finally, CRA also expanded slightly the list of eligible expenses that can be included. Um, up until this year, for example, internet access uh, was not included, uh, but that internet access fee can now be included as an eligible expense. And partial condo fees, and apparently they've always kind of been there, but um, they've now clarified that some parts of condo fees, if people are working out of a condo, can also be claimed as part of their home office expense if they work from home in the year. So next slide, just a couple other small details around this particular change is on the next slide. Essentially, <clears throat> this particular new approach is available to both salaried and commissioned employees. There are slight differences in how you can claim certain expenses between salary and commission employees, but fundamentally the approach is the same. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so if they choose to itemize this, obviously go the more detailed version, as I said, you will be asked by your employee to fill out these 2200 forms. So it's really up to the employee to tell you that they need that form to be signed in order for them to be able to access it. Otherwise, they can just take the flat rate option and there's no intervention by the employer whatsoever. Um, now, uh, the only thing that we should mention, of course, is that there is still the original longer T2200 form, which may still be required for some employees who claim vehicle expenses. So vehicle expenses are not part of the flat rate option. They're not part of the shortened T2200. The only time vehicle expenses can be claimed is if they take the longer form as well. So that if there's a situation where you have employees using vehicles, then that potentially means you still have to go back to the original T2200 form uh, for them. Um, so that's it. Essentially, that's the way it's going to work. We suspect most employees will probably do the flat rate option because it's the easiest, which also would be the easiest for the employer. Uh, but certainly feel free to share that with uh, your staff if it's applicable to them. Um, or, and uh, hopefully that will help make things a little bit easier uh, come tax time in 2021. All right, we're moving to the next slide. Unfortunately, so that was a bit of the you know, good news. Um, the bad news is that business closures continue to happen right across Canada. So um, in Ontario this past week, they did expand lockdown measures uh, effective earlier this week to S Windsor, Essex and York region. Um, and uh, more restrictions may be coming uh, very soon. Saskatchewan also has expanded its restrictions. You can see there some of the difference where, when things are going to be happening um, in Saskatchewan. Uh, both Saskatchewan and Quebec took an interesting approach in that they're basically saying that retail can remain open to, in some capacity until December 25th. And as of December 25th, Saskatchewan is now is going to reduce retail capacity to 50% and large retailers are going to go down to 25%. And in Quebec, they're actually basically shutting down all retail as of uh, December 25th. So all non-essential retail and personal services are closed from December 25th until January 11th in Quebec. They're not even going to allow curbside pickup in Quebec for non-essential items, which is a bit um, interesting and bizarre and is something we're certainly going to be pushing them to potentially reverse in Quebec because that doesn't seem to make any sense not allowing any curbside pickup at all so effectively shutting those businesses down for about two weeks yeah i just wanted to um, come in on that one corinne because um, as members um, in other provinces know we've been very active on fighting for 
um, keeping business as open as is reasonable to do, given the health conditions, um, and also making sure there's fairness between big box uh, stores and small business, so not doing what Ontario did and allowing the big box stores to remain open and selling non-essential um, goods while shutting down smaller retailers. Um, and in Quebec, this curbside uh, provision, just, and, uh, you know, I was talking to our colleague who leads our Quebec uh, legislative work, and he was saying it was kind of at odds with what they were, you know, they had been talking to the government about making sure that um, curbside was still allowed. So we're, we're fighting um, uh, for that. And in other parts of the country, we're, we're fighting, we're very active uh, to make sure that whatever closures are happening are fair and, uh, and reasonable. Um, so tricky balance uh, sometimes, but I just wanted to weigh in on that. Yeah, and I think the other thing they did in Quebec, though, that was good is that they're actually, um, as, as they shut down non-essential, that means even in large retailers that may have both essential and non-essential, there is no selling of non-essential items in the large retailers, which is similar to what Manitoba has done, which is not perfect, but at least it's better uh, than uh, allowing this large retailers to just sell everything, um, which is the case, of course, as everyone knows in Ontario right now. Yeah, that's right. I think they saw the business reaction. Um, I mean, it wasn't it, obviously we were we were part of that, and also business owners themselves in Ontario they saw that reaction and they didn't want to they didn't want to have that in other parts of, of Canada. I think that's helped in in other provinces as well. Okay, so that's where we're at on business closures this week. Unfortunately, not good news. Um, and hopefully, next time um, we, you know, come into the new year, things will start to improve. Given that, you know, we'll be through the holiday season, and um, hopefully, the uh, vaccine will be a little further along. All right, if we move to, to the next slide. <clears throat> We now want to do a bit really quick updates on some new information or just um, expand on some information we may have shared in the past on the, the three uh, emergency programs. Not a lot new in any of them, but first on the Canada Emergency Business Account, we want to let you know that, with the, as you know, the uh, expansion, the $20,000 extra expansion of the SIBA loan uh, has been now available for, um, I think, a little over a week or so. Uh, maybe, yeah, it's about a week now, um, and that, uh, or maybe it's two weeks, anyway, it's been around now for a number of days, uh, and we have been hearing from folks that uh, some businesses are being declined or are being told they're not successful. This is a really important um, distinction. This is something EDC itself is saying. It's not that people are being declined or rejected, is that they're being told they're not successful at this point for the CBS expansion because, um, they may need additional, EDC may need additional information to basically understand whether that everything is, is correct in the actual application form, um, or they are doing some validation work, uh, because as you may recall, if you applied for SEBA through the payroll stream at the beginning, it just went through fairly quickly, and often what they're doing now is what they call sort of this post-validation, post-funding validation, and they're certainly, they may be finding a few discrepancies, and so they want to correct those discrepancies before providing the money. Um, so it could be that the, the CRA business number is different between uh, what you have put into the system and what they're seeing from CRA. Um, so these are corrections that have to be made. Um, so depending on the reason for the, for the decline or what they're saying is the lack of success at this point, you may be able to remedy this application. Um, and essentially what they're trying to do is they're putting together a process for mediation right now at EDC. However, it's not yet available. And they are telling them, and it's on their website as well, they're telling people that if you get a not successful note from your bank saying that um, essentially they can't provide you with the funds right now, that you may be able to fix that come January once they have built the systems they need to address the number of what they're calling anomalies in the system and hopefully have it corrected. So basically, if you're in this category uh, of businesses that maybe have been told that you've not been successful so far, um, if you don't hear from your bank by say mid to end January, then you should be calling the SEBA call center to find out what's going on. So essentially they're working through processes now to maybe try to fix those particular issues. The vast majority of them are probably quite fixable. It's just going to take them a little bit longer to get there. So it's not ideal for those businesses facing that situation. However, we're hoping that for most of those businesses, you'll be able to get resolution um, sometime early in the new year. Rachel. Yeah, I just wanted to remind um, those who are on this call, just to remember that if you haven't gotten your expansion yet, 
um, that the uh, loan, the SIBA forgivable portion is actually taxable in the year you've received the SIBA, not in the year that you received the forgivable loan portion, but the year that you've received the SIBA loan. Um, and that also goes for the forgivable portion that comes with the expansion. So if uh, you're in the situation where you can hang, hang on a little bit longer, um, you might want to talk to your accountant about whether it's the right move for you to just wait for the new year anyways um, to try to postpone some of those uh, taxes or yeah. that will eventually come your way. Yeah, thanks Rachel. Okay, so that's the update on the SIBA. Uh, we go to the next slide. We have a couple things we wanted to mention on the wage subsidy as well. So um, the next period, which is period 10 that we're in right now, which actually ends December 19th, so that would be, I guess, on Saturday. Uh, you're supposed to be able to start up being able to apply for that period starting on Sunday, December 20th or Monday. So you can start applying for the next period for the period that we're in right now as uh, as early as next week. Um, and then, as you know, starting with period 11, which actually starts December 20th, the maximum amount of subsidy for the wage subsidy goes up to 75 percent. Um, this is a reminder of how that's going to work. Essentially, that means that if you have a revenue loss of 50 percent or less, nothing really changes for you from the current system. Everything remains the same. You basically take the amount of your revenue loss and you multiply it by 0 0.8, and that'll be the amount of your subsidy. Where the extra amount comes in when it comes to the subsidy is for anybody who has a revenue loss greater than 50%. If you have a revenue loss greater than 50%, every, whatever amount you have above 50% under the old system was multiplied by 1.25. Under this new process, you now multiply it by 1.75, which then will bring you up to a much higher wage subsidy more quickly. And basically, once you reach a revenue loss of 70%, that's when you'll be able to get a 75% wage subsidy. So that's basically the change that's taking place starting December 20th for the next three months. Um, the other question we're getting a lot of is, where how do you compare your revenue loss starting in the next period is it uh january 2021 to january 2020 or january 2019 um and we've been told by cra so far nope go back one slide please <laughs> we've been told by cra so far that um essentially you it goes back to january 2020 so for this coming one you'll be uh, you'll and as you know you always have a choice between two months december um, the current month you're in and the previous month and whoever one has the greater revenue loss that's the month you can use as your revenue loss comparison so for january 2021 you can compare it either december 2019 or january 2020 so that's how it's going to be sort of fixed for the moment and the same will be true for sort of january and february um, the march period because it ends in mid-march it sort of only ends at sort of the month of February, so we don't know how it's going to work post uh, February. But um, that is the, the 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 direction so far we're getting from CRA is how it's going to work. And I believe Rachel, new information about all of this is going to be up in the next few days to sort of clarify exactly what CRA's intent is on that front. Yeah, I was just going to add that um, from what we're hearing from CRA, they're planning on uh, posting more about this next week on their website. Yes. Um, and, and just to let you know, um, as a listener, that um, not to, to panic if uh, you notice that the, the portals don't open up like the day after um, period 11, which ends on January 17th. Um, it, generally, uh, it w if a, a, a regulatory change is required, it might take up to a week after that uh, January 17th date before the applications will open, and that's kind of uh, a normal uh, thing. So just a reminder to, to take a breath and, and not to panic if you don't see it there. So you're talking about period 12, right? Uh, I'm talking about the applications for, for period 11. 11. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So applications for period 11 may not open the day after uh, the period ends, but it may take a few more days after that because we're also waiting for regulat regulatory changes uh, to allow for these changes to come about. Uh, and they have not all been approved, but uh, it will happen fairly soon after the end of the period 11. Okay, so that's the wage subsidy. So I think I'm turning it back over to my colleagues, uh, Laura uh, and uh, 
others to sort of talk about the rent subsidy, which I think is the next slide. So back over to you. Thanks, Corinne, and I'll invite uh, Rachel to um, join me for, for helping with this. One of the updates I wanted to provide is that we did have a meeting with um, the minister, with Minister Freeland's uh, staff on the issues that we're hearing with respect to the rent subsidy. This includes the complicating, you know, how complicated it is to deal with the non-arms length. So if you're in the situation where you have a hold co and an op co um, and you know, that just how complicated that is. And so we've written a letter and you can click on the link if you're inter if you're a policy geek and you want to see what's included in the letter, um, you can click on that link. But we are raising that non-arms length issue as well as the retroactive support for those of you who were shut out of SECRA is in that letter. New business, uh, new businesses and their eligibility um, is also in that letter. Um, and there's a, a few other um, issues there. So I just wanted to let you know that we have, we are working the policy channels as well as the CRA trying to get the details of how the existing program works. We're also trying to get some changes to it. Um, and I just had another really good issue come in um, through the questions. I think it was Len who had made the comment that he has a, a mortgage arrangement that's non-traditional and that was considered eligible under SECRA but not under SUS. So, or sorry, SIRS. So Len, we'll add your issue um, to our um, to our uh, the, the the issues that we're raising with the finance ministers, but I, ju I just wanted to let you know that that's going to take some time. As you know, we're a never give up, never go away kind of organization, and we really do have to really keep knocking on the door with these things. That's not going to happen in the next week or two, uh, but we are working on those issues. So we'll be updated on that. Okay, so that's on the policy side. And then if we move to uh, some of the frequently asked questions, I think on the next slide on SIRS, um, we, before I get to the OPCO hold co again, which unfortunately we don't have much that's really new to update you on, a few maybe clarifications, but there are a number of questions, Rachel's coming through the, the, the questions from webinar participants around payments and whether payments have been made. And we do know from last week's webinar that some people have started getting their payments for the rent subsidy. And I think, can you remind me how long CRA was saying, was it five to eight days that they expect, or did I make that up in my mind? No, I think you're right there. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hard to keep track of all of the details, um, but I think they're saying five to eight days. So what would you advise people if they haven't, if they're worried and they haven't gotten their rent subsidy in their account. Is there any advice for people in that situation? Because we have uh, Lori was asking about that. Myra was asking about that. A couple questions on that. Yeah, so one, you want to keep in mind what is the, do you have a direct deposit set up or not? Because that could take a little bit of time. Uh, do you, uh, are you just waiting for snail mail to arrive? Uh, because that will add on to that three to eight days as well, or five to eight days as well. Um, and and what you can potentially do is give CRA a call to, to see if it was well received, or you can go into your portal um, and see what um, it looks like there. Um, so those are some options of things that, that you can do. And we also have the CRA Business Inquiries uh, phone number there at the bottom of this slide um, if, you, if you do need to call CRA about that kind of thing. Great. Okay. Um, thanks for that, uh, Rachel. Now let's um, get into this uh, opco hold co again. And you know, this I would say is still a bit murky. Um, and we're still, I think, waiting for. If any uh, members are in the situation where they've applied and they're in this situation, we'd love to hear from you. And if, especially if you've used these elections, that may be a little bit of a workaround. And whether that's a, a good workaround or not, because what we're hearing from some of our our, uh, our members are suggesting that this isn't going to be that helpful. So, um, but basically, the OPCO, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's possible elections you can make to work around this. Um, and we flagged what they are, although, again, we suggest if you're in this situation that you talk to your accountant, because uh, there are some caveats 
for example, your SIRS and your SUS revenue calculations have to be consistent. So you have to make sure you're picking up a path that works best for you looking at your overall picture. And again, that's something that every, every uh, lots of, there may be lots of different situations and, and your elections have to match up. So you might want to check with your um, accountant about that. But um, Rachel, do you want to try and walk us through this a little bit? I, I'm going to hand it over to you. You've been in more recent talks with CRA than I have, but this is pretty close to what we were saying last week. There's nothing, you know, we didn't get anything wrong last week, so that's always helpful. Uh, but we did get a little bit more clarity, I think. Yeah, for sure. And they just wanted to, so CRA did look at these slides and they gave us feedback on this and they just, they wanted us to add the opco would not be eligible, assuming all rent uh, paid goes to the hold code, just, just because that's been consistent and they just wanted to make sure that was clear. Um, but the hold co might still be eligible. Um, and, and what we're saying, because we don't want to go too much into the details, because as Laura mentioned, neither of us are, are accountants. Um, but you should look at these elections, this, this 4B and 4D election, the consolidation of affiliate, uh, affiliated entities and, and non-arms length revenues. Um, those are like the short forms of them. But, but those are the elections that you really want to talk to your accountant about um, and, and see if really that makes sense uh, because you will have to determine um, those elections for the SIRs and the SUs and you'll have to make sure that they look consistent because that might be an easy red flag for CRA come audit time. They'll say, oh, these, these uh, elections don't match up. So we're going to call them just to make sure that this was done correctly. Um, so hopefully that can avoid those issues. Um, and then we also kind of want us, they also wanted us to remind you that uh, rent will still not, non-arms length rent will still not be eligible, but other arms length uh, eligible expenses for the whole co may be eligible. Um, and again, there might be an avenue here that you want to talk to your accountant uh, about averaging revenues. Uh, so that's that's another thing that I would definitely push you towards uh, speaking to your accountant about. Um, and then the last point that we just want to make sure that you guys know is that if your hold co was not impacted by a mandated closure, um, so if there was no restriction to your, your no partial or full restriction to your business, your hold co, then they would not be eligible for the top up subsidy. Um, so also known as the lock down support uh, subsidy. Right, and we continue to advocate for a simpler um, path here. But Rachel, just to clarify, because there was one question on this, um, you know, that first point, the OPCO would not be eligible, assuming all rent paid goes to the hold co. If there is some um, arm's length revenue, like some arm's length rent, let's say, I, I don't, I can't, I can't totally imagine the scenarios, but let's say you're paying rent partly to the, your, hold, your own hold co, but partly to another arm's length, then that portion of the revenue would be eligible. The portion that's arm's length. So again, this is kind of one of those parts of the election. If you elect to consolidate, um, there there might be a, a, an average weight, the weighted average uh, calculation that your your accountant can make. Um, so there there is a, an avenue here that you should talk to your accountant about. Um, and I don't really want to get into too many details about it because uh, I'm kind of going across that line there. Um, but again, something you should should look at and speak to your accountant about. Yeah, and Elena is um, suggesting that it would be good to have a webinar with CRA. Elena, totally agree. We did one with CRA, and there's a link in the presentation if you want to check it out. But I think we need to have another one with them, and so we'll we'll put that into the list of um, uh, uh, requests. Okay, um, let's um, go to the next slide. Next slide. Yeah, there we go. So this is just in case you want to. <laughs> If you really want to geek out on the um, elections that you can make under the revenue uh, on the on the on the rent subsidy piece, uh, Rachel has put tried to put in plain language CRA's language. And Rachel, you've actually run this table through CRA, and they've they've given you the green light that this is the yeah. plain language is acceptable. Yeah, and, and to be quite honest, the the reason why we did this is because for the SUs, a lot of you guys were saying 
these are really confusing. I see them in my application. I'm required to attest to them. I don't understand what this means. Uh, so, so we've, you can see the link there to the 125.7, which means the Income Tax Act, um, the, the SERS program rule elections, and there's a link there to the attestation form that you'll be required to sign as well uh, when you apply for the SERS. Um, and we've taken the different parts there and kind of simplified each election. So the first one is the, the um, whether you combined or separated your financial statements with other entities. And then the second one is if uh, you have other affiliated groups uh, that you're consolidating your revenues with. So, and it's, a, it's kind of a yes or no, you check the box off if, if that, that applies to you. The, uh, the third one there is um, our uh, is the entity a joint venture so by by two parties um, or more and, and has its own revenues that are being used separately from the other parties and then the fourth one is is this uh, big non arms length uh, uh, election that uh, we've been talking about that you should look into with your accountant which is why we say accountant recommended in red there um, the next one it has to do with the the cash versus accrual um, method, which is something that CFIB has also uh, really worked on on making available to you through the SUS and and the SERS programs as well. Um, so tipping my hat off to us there. Um, and then the, the fifth one has to do with if you have acquired a business or part of a business during the qualifying period or before that. Um, and there's a couple conditions there for, for if you can consolidate those revenues. Um, but definitely speak to your accountant about if that situation applies to you or not. Um, the, the second last one there is if you use the alternative approach. And this is a pretty standard um, election for many of you who have decided you're going to use the January and February revenues. So you'll have to tick off this box if that was you. And then the last one, um, it, it just asks whether you're a charity or a not-for-profit um, and, and if you decided to exclude government funding. So, so hopefully that'll help you um, decide what you do need to check off or, or what you don't. Um, and, and hopefully that, that simplifies things for you. So Alana is asking, where is 4B and 4D? 4B, so that 4B is the second one there, and then 4D, um, it, it's uh, that fourth one there, and we've included that, um, those 4B and D, we've included the sections of the Income Tax Act in each um, on the left-hand side. Yeah, and so apologies for, you know, we're the, especially on the rent subsidy, we're kind of getting into some, some weeds here, but um, I know for many of you, this is a big question. Um, Manuel, is asking, can we confirm if, if he needs to set up a, a direct deposit specifically for the rent subsidy? And apparently the link has been down for a few days, so that's good for others to know. Yeah, we've been hearing this as well um, on our side. It, we've heard it's temporarily down, but you can call in um, to the, the um, I, I know the, the last four digits is like eight eight one eight eight two eight one um that that cra line um and you can set that up over the phone uh so that's that's an avenue there great okay and we'll come back to answer a few more sirs questions but let's uh, move on to the next uh slide in the webinar um, and Rachel, this is uh, just a little bit of a kind of what do you do if you get stuck? And so just some pathways to um, answer that question. We've got the CRA business inquiries number. Um, you've got our helpline. Often if it's a more technical rent subsidy question, those are going to be escalated. Um, even through our helpline, uh, Rachel's become, as you can see, a bit of an expert on this. So um, you may end up getting some personal help from Rachel if you call that line. Uh, but be patient because they may, the, the counselors who are answering are trying to answer all kinds of inquiries and the more specific ones on rent um, may have to get escalated to Rachel's uh, desk. And there are a couple of other of us uh, who, are, who are working on the more complex rent uh, questions. And then there's the government guidance information. There is, we did do an early webinar with CRA. It doesn't go in depth on this hold co-op co issue. So if that's what you're looking for, 
um, you're not going to find it in that webinar, but um, there's lots of other good information there. So if you want to hear it directly from CRA, there's a webinar there. Helpful recommendation to have another webinar with CRA, which we will try to do. And of course, we have to remind everyone to breathe with these things and don't panic. Chances are, if you're upset, confused, frustrated with an application or trying to get answers to something, you are not alone and everybody's trying to work through this. So um, at least that that can be uh, hopefully some, uh, some comfort. It might not totally ease your frustration, but a little bit of reassurance that it's not you. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, Corinne, I think you're coming back to help us with um, some fun tax increases for 2021. Unfortunately, um, they're not so good. Exactly. Yeah, so um, essentially we wanted to give you a heads up that come January 1st, there are a few tax changes you need to be aware of, especially if you have employees. Um, the first piece of bad news, which I think I already shared last week, but I wanted to give you a bit more details of what's changing, is the fact that CPP, um, the Canada Pension Plan premiums, and the Quebec Pension Plan premiums are going up January 1st. Um, this is part of a five-year plan the government put in place back in 2018, I believe, and started in 2019, so this is year three. Um, to increase uh, the amount of benefits for individuals uh, from a quarter of their income to a third. Um, and so they are going ahead with this increase. We're continuing to push back for them to defer it or do something or offset it somehow. But as of right now, uh, January 1st, the CPP premiums go up from 5.25% to 5.45% for both employers and employees. So employees will also see their uh, take-home pay go down. As well, the maximum pensionable earnings increases from 58,700 to 61,600, which is actually a bigger than normal jump as well. Um, there's this weird anomaly in 2020 because there was an unfortunate, obviously, decline in mostly um, in lots of part-time employment earlier in the year, which actually artificially raised the average wages in Canada for a period of time. So there's actually a bigger jump than normal in the maximum pensionable earnings this year. Uh, which again we thought was a bit odd to go forward with in the year that we're facing but um, so far that is the government's intention to do so that is what's published it's what's out there it's what's being advertised by the government so that is what's happening january 1st with cpp ei on the other hand um, they did freeze it and it's going to be frozen for 2021 and 2022 at 2020 rates so what is that? That's $158 for employees and $221 for employers for $100 of insurable earnings. However, the maximum insurable earnings do go up and they go from $54,200 to $56,300. And finally, uh, we wanted to give you a heads up at the federal level at least. Um, this is not until April, so there's a few more months before this happens, but the federal carbon tax or what they call the federal carbon backstop is also slated to go up in the provinces of which it applies, which is for now uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario. And it'll go from $30 a ton to $40 a ton, effective April 1st, 2021. We're also asking them to defer this one, uh, depending, of course, how things are going to be by April 1st. We suspect it'll still be a little bit tough. So why can't we defer this as well um, to help those businesses that are very, some, some sectors of the economies are very heavily affected by this particular change, others less so. Um, it's also been a tax uh, that we felt has been unfairly um, burdensome for many small companies because all businesses actually pay about half this tax, uh, but in the rebates go mostly back to homeowners. Uh, there's only a small proportion, about 10%, that's set aside for small businesses and municipalities and so forth. So we've been sort of asking them to rethink about how they redistribute, redistribute the, um, the revenues that they receive from this carbon tax in those provinces for which it applies. So those are the unfortunate bad news still coming uh, in 2021, but we want you to be prepared and know what it is that you may be facing as an employer or as a business owner in 2021 at this point in time. Okay, I think that may be it. Back over to uh, you, Laura. And uh, I think we have some Great. fun. Why don't we all, why don't we all, yeah, why don't we all come back? And mm. again, 
this is an important tip, maybe a good New Year's resolution if you haven't if you haven't started it, but just keeping a, a business uh, journal with some of the important decisions, dates, you know, when do you have to file your next SUES application, that kind of thing, but also in case you get uh, audited. And I think we're going to go to uh, questions next. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so here's our um, helpline number, and we're going to take some some of your questions. We also have what would a Christmas uh, a quick holiday webinar be without a door prize. So um, you might want to hang out um, just for a few more minutes because uh, we do have a door prize that we'll give out in a in a few minutes and I'll explain that. Um, but we've got a number of questions, um, Rachel, on on the what counts as rent. And I know we do have a table on this in that I think we put in the appendix. So I'm wondering if we could maybe pull that up from the appendix. Um, so I'm going to ask who, yeah, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay. Yeah, there, there we go. Oh, one back. Uh, no, go back. There, there we go. So this is what eligible, what expenses are eligible. We're getting a number of questions on this, but under a lease. And so um, the question that uh, Carol is asking is, has there been any confirmation at this point as to whether renters can deduct insurance and utilities if they are outlined in their lease? Three people I spoke to at CRA said yes, but last week during your webinar, you said you thought um, not any news. So this was one that we wanted to get a little bit more clarity on, Rachel, and I know you talked to CRA about this as well. So do you want to take a crack at that? Yeah, so if it's included under your net lease, which is what I heard um, her say, um, then yes, it would be something that otherwise her, her landlord would have had to pay, but she has agreed to take on. Um, and so you can see that in this table, we have utilities, hydro, gas, water. But again, it has to be included under your net lease, uh, which is again, sounds like it is the case. Great. Okay, and so Kim is asking about HST, which is also covered in this table. And um, Kim, as you can see, HST sales taxes such as GST and HST are not um, eligible um, expenses. So thank you. I just wanted to um, let everyone know that this table from last week's webinar is in the appendix. Uh, we did take off the, uh, I think, the star around um, utilities because we did get that uh, confirmation from CRA. We just had a little bit of a confusing conversation with them where they talked about, you know, if you have like extraordinary utility costs that you wouldn't expect the landlord to pay, that those would be outside of the um, arrangement. So we just wanted to get some more clarity around that. Okay, um, Corinne, you probably have some Sue's questions or some SEBA questions that you want to get to and we'll keep uh, mixing it up and maybe we can move the slide back deck back to where we've got the, um, uh, yeah, there you go, back to our, our number so that people have that. Yeah, so I've got a number of questions around SEBA and payments around SEBA, when that's gonna come through. Um, so Alan was saying that uh, he applied 10 days or more ago through the bank and still hasn't heard anything. Uh, others have asked if anybody has been received their SIBA loans yet, and I have another uh, webinar participant who just sent a note saying, I've got it. <laughs> so, so some folks are getting them, uh, so it is starting to flow, the money. Um, but generally speaking, Alan, it can take, EDC is saying it take 10 to 15 business days, so it might just have to be patient. However, I did send Alan, and just for others to know, there is a now online self-service option where you can go in and check the status of your application through EDC. So you just, just type Google CB, um, CBA, and uh, you'll see CBA questions come up, and at the very top, they have a link there to their new self-service page. So you can go in and check to see the status of your application at this point in time. So Alan, go check that out, and others too who are interested um, in learning more about that. Um, the other question I'm getting quite a bit on on SEBA is around um, the forgivable. What's the forgivable portion, and when does it apply to your taxes? So again, that question is coming up quite a bit. So our understanding from CRA is that you have to claim the amount, the forgivable portion of your SEBA loan in the year you receive the SEBA loan. So if you're, and it's based on your fiscal year. So obviously you claim it when you do your taxes. So if your fiscal year is calendar year, then you have to claim it in 2020. 
Uh, for those of you that may want to wait till 2021, then just maybe wait a couple more weeks and then you can claim it in next year's taxes. However, it is based more on the fiscal year of your business. So whenever you actually do your taxes for your business, not necessarily on the calendar year, but I know many people, it's the same thing. So that's essentially how it works. Somebody asked, well, how's that? How's that fair? Because you don't even know if you'll be able to use a forgivable portion until you pay it back. Yes, we also raise that with CRA. And um, the fact is CRA is telling us that they will credit that amount come 2022 if you're not able to pay back the loan and therefore lose the forgivable portion. They will then credit you back any amounts that you had paid in previous years on that loan. So lots of sort of questions I see around that and hopefully that helps clarify a few things who are, are working through the SEMA loan at the moment. Um, I do have others, but maybe we'll go back and forth a little bit to see if you have things you want to uh, raise at this point. I'm Rachel, not sure if you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not, not sure if you. Throw in. And Brendan, feel free to join us if you've got questions you want to put in as well. I know you're busy answering some of them, but feel free to share your video so we can see your cute hat again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my apologies. Yeah, I was feverishly typing away answering questions, but I do have one to pose to our. Our SIRS experts, if you guys are ready for a, a tricky one. Yeah, I was uh, um, I was just going to add um, to to Corinne's SIBA train of thought there. I'm not sure if you addressed the the 40k um, eligibility or not, but I'm getting a lot of um, questions saying so. You only need to have 40k worth um, for the non-deferrable expense stream, and the answer is yes. Uh, you only need the 40k, uh, yeah. which is which is good. Think. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, and I had a few of that as well. So thank you for clarifying that. It did not change, even though you get a 60k loan, you still only need 40k to apply for the non-deferrable expense. So thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Now I think I'm ready for your question, Brendan. <laughs> okay. Let's talk rent subsidy for a moment. And this is actually a question we're getting a lot of the business resources line. So this is important to know. Um, and and I believe the answer will go for both the rent subsidy program as well as the wage subsidy program. Um, so Kendall's question is that they operated a single location for a business up until September 2020. So being qualified for that location is not a problem. She's been operating a business for a few years. However, they opened up a second location, um, September 2020. And um, basically, she's wondering, well, we're getting revenues from that location as well. So on the whole, if you consider all of the revenues from both locations, they're down 15%. Um, but of course, because that second location uh, is new, it's not actually representative of you know their overall uh, decrease in revenue. So um, basically, what she's wondering is, can can they separate those two locations and consider them on two separate bases, or do they have to add in the revenues for both locations in consideration of their SERS application? Yeah, and so this one is it's important to remember that uh, both the SUs and the SERS are 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 applied for on an entity base uh, on an entity level basis um, however there might be some elections uh, that you might be able to take advantage of um, but one thing that I would probably mention for this member is to remember that um, if you have an agreement um, that has been made after October 9th um, that 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 states your your rent that that might um not be eligible for for the suit su the the SERS but again there might be an avenue for you uh, to consolidate your entities through the elections so to talk to your accountant about about those kinds of things for sure i think if i understand the question though she's not wanting to consolidate she's wanting to no. have the opposite to separate them and um, this is an issue that we raised in our policy letter. So Rachel's quite right that right now you have to apply at the entity level, um, which seems kind of unfair. In this case, it's an interesting case because one of the businesses on its own um, wouldn't have been eligible. Um, so it's an interesting, it's actually a very interesting case that's being raised here and one that we might want to raise. But what we're fighting for on the rent subsidy is that you can apply location by location um, and not have to consolidate. Whether we're going to have any luck with that, I don't know, but there are all kinds of scenarios we're hearing about um, that make the um, uh, entity level application problematic. So we do hear you on, on that. Yeah, and our, our letter, like uh, Laura mentioned, does completely address that because we have been hearing that businesses who are growing can't can't uh, use this in the way that they want to either. 
Yeah. yeah and exactly. although it doesn't happen quickly, we have had some success in, you know, as we hear from you, uh, raising your concerns with government and then getting governments to consider changes to the programs. And there have been a number of changes to the programs um, as a result of as a result of that. Um, I am going to stick with rent subsidy for a moment, Rachel, and put another one because I think in talking about what's covered but on the um, under the the net lease that that's still the second area of confusion. I would say the two big areas of confusion are the hold co op co and the the what's covered. So um, Tara is asking if I'm responsible for utilities, but it's not listed explicitly. Can I ask my landlord for a clarification document to add to my lease and Unfortunately, I don't think we probably have a great news answer to that. Yeah, so a clarification document. Um, that's not something I've heard of uh, as suggested before on my end. But um, I think if you, if you, yeah, it would be something we would have to look into, I think. Yeah. And Lydia's asking about storage fees, um, and that was an outstanding question for her that she noticed that storage fees are added here. Do you want to give any clarification on storage fees? Yeah, and so CRA has, has determined that uh, a storage area, if it's um, at arm's length, um, is is a legitimate like business operating uh, location that you can be renting. Um, so it would be eligible um, for you to include your rent, uh, your rental fees for the storage fee. Okay, and one more along these lines. Hello, I, this is from Wendy. Just wanted to clarify the utility payments. Does this include if we pay direct to the utility company and not the landlord? So again, you wanna make sure that it is under your net lease. So you are required to cover your landlord's expense in this case, and it would be acceptable if it's included in your lease and even if you pay it to a third party. Yeah, so some of those third party payments, if it's really clear in your lease that you're not paying it directly to the landlord, but you're expected to cover it, um, those will be covered, but it's, you know, I would say probably there's some gray zone here in terms of what's going to be accepted or not. And our best advice from last week's webinar is to claim what you're sure about, um, which, you know, the base rent, for example, would be in that category, to claim what you're reasonably sure about um, and then amend your application later if you feel like you still can't get the clarity you need on some of these other um, expenses. And that may be depends a little bit on your tolerance for risk um, in dealing with the CRA. Um, so, but that would be sort of basic generic advice that we would give uh, because it's always easier to ask for more than it is to, um, you know, have to get audited and, and deal with um, uh, making mistakes and paying, paying things back. So that's our best advice, um, but still definitely those are the two uh, murkiest areas, um, although getting a little bit clearer. Okay, what other questions do we have? Anything more on um, SIBA, SUS, taxes? Corinne, I've got one for you about what is our position on uh, these all these new taxes. <laughs> I said we've been, we've been opposed to anything new, but what is yeah. CFIB's view on the announced yeah. continued increase to the carbon tax? Farouk wants to know. Yeah, yeah, so I, th I think I mentioned already, I mean, on this, yeah, um, CPP, we've been pushing for a deferral of CPP and hoping to put it off at least a year. Um, we'd love to see it sort of scrapped altogether. We're not sure it's the best solution to increasing people's um, retirement, but that's a whole other debate to discuss at another time. Uh, for now, it's more just to defer it. Um, and on the carbon tax, as I mentioned, it's, it's one that our, um, we, we found that the carbon tax in its current form is unfair to small companies. So in that, half about 50 percent of the revenue that is collected through the carbon tax is actually uh, coming from small business owners so they actually contribute a large amount of the revenues the government is collecting on the carbon tax um, this is partly because very large emitters are on a completely separate system and so and small businesses are lumped in with consumers so about half of it is 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 paid for by small business owners but 90 percent of the carbon tax revenues are then paid back in the form of rebates to individual homeowners um, and only 10% is left over to provide um, programming to smaller companies to help them with, um, you know, their costs in purchasing energy efficient equipment. 
Um, and in fact, of that amount, they were supposed to create two programs and uh, one of them, which was going to have sort of smaller dollar values associated with it, has still never been announced. We're still waiting for it. So we're still um, not a huge fan of this particular carbon tax. We don't believe it's fair for small businesses that it skews against them. And um, so we believe there's got to be another solution that will be um, better and more fair to small businesses when it comes to dealing with uh, carbon tax issues. Okay, great. I think I'm going to actually announce our door prize winner because we're at the top of the hour. We typically stay a little bit later to answer some more questions, but I'd like to uh, get to that. So um, if, yeah, so this year we had a, um, a big thank you contest as part of our Small Business Every Day campaign. And one of the things we did is we had um, uh, items from independent businesses right across Canada and as part of the the um, the, the way the contest worked was the consumer nominated their favorite business, the consumer got a thank you box, and the business got a thank you box. And we have an extra thank you box um, with these um, uh, goodies from, from businesses across Canada, including our Bravo the Bear, super cute little stuff there that says I support a uh, small business. And so our door prize today, so what would a holiday party be without a door prize? We thought we'd give, give, give this one, one away. Our door prize today goes to Amanda LaRoque. And so Amanda, uh, congratulations. And Alexa will reach out to you for your address so that we can um, send you a nice box filled with um, uh, goodies from independent businesses across Canada. And we may be doing more of these contests um, in the year ahead to just kind of continue to encourage local shopping. So if you have something that you would like to be included in a thank in a future thank you box, please let us know. Um, maybe these beautiful uh, holiday hats would make a good uh, a contribution to the box. Anyway, um, we'll be happy to do that. And I think, um, Corinne, we also wanted to talk a little bit about our approach to webinars going forward. And yeah. so why don't do that uh, now. So this is the last one of the year, but I do want everyone to know that you we're not we're we're still here. So if you need to call us, we have counselors on through the uh, through the I'm not obviously on the statutory holidays, but through the holidays we do have counselors staffing the phones. So um, we're uh, we're not all going home. <laughs> we're we're here for you. And so that number is on the is on the webinar uh, screen. I think it's one slide go in case you need us that way and uh, so feel free to reach out of course our our, our website is also being updated um, and you can also get many of us uh, you know um, Dan and I try to respond to the anything we get through Twitter so uh, Dan our president is at CFIB and certainly you can follow him and um, get him that way I'm, I'm at CFIB Ideas, so that's another way to get a hold of us. And then going forward into the new year, Corinne, we were talking about having a webinar with a tax uh, person on, I think it was the 14th, if I'm not mistaken, of January. Yeah. Correct. So January 14th. Um, so what we're going to do is on the January 7th, which would be the first Thursday after the new year, um, we may or may not do one that week. We'll just give you a heads up. If there is some new announcements or some new things that are happening that we feel we need to get in front of you, we will have one that week. We may be a bit of a skeleton crew that week, but we will do one. However, if nothing new has really emerged uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks, then we will start up again for sure on the 14th with a special guest, uh, a tax practitioner or a tax advisor who is going to help us talk to you about what to expect um, when it comes to taxation in uh, 2021. So maybe, you know, so think about some questions you may have in regards to, it could be T4 slips, it could be how you calculate certain things for your own company, um, and he'll be here to help answer some of those questions and probably have a lot more in-depth knowledge than any of us do when it comes to those tax issues. Yeah, so and our plan is to keep running these webinars as long as they're needed. And we know that uh, while we're hopefully through the worst of the pandemic storm uh, by early 2021, uh, it's not quite over. It's not quite over yet. And of course, the support programs go go through June. So we'll 
continue to do them weekly for as long as they are needed and we'll continue to look at those topics that people want to cover helpful suggestion again to get CRA on um, again with the with the various uh, support programs and we'll keep bringing you what's new and with that maybe I'll call Rachel up as well and we'll do our kind of our our, our wrap up if we go to our final slide I added a little holiday I decorated the slide deck this year so I'm this uh, for this webinar. my colleagues were coming me but um, so that last slide, I think, has has the sleigh going into the good night. Um, yeah, there we go. So um, we all want to wish you, obviously, a happy holiday. So I'm going to go around. Of course, if there's any last burning questions you want to slip in as part of your final remarks, go ahead. But I'll I'll start with you, Rachel. I'll go to you, Brendan, Corinne, and then I'll I'll anchor us and we'll um, we'll close out our final webinar of the year. So Rachel, do you want to go first? Yeah, I have a couple. Uh, one question that I wanted to make sure got in there, um, and someone asked if it was worth mentioning the changes to T4s, and I'm seeing a, quite a few questions on T4s. Um, so there were changes, there are changes on how to report uh, employment income during COVID-19. So you'll notice in the regular T4 um, form that there are four different codes that you can use. Um, and I've asked Alexa to put a link um, in the chat so you can find the T4 changes there. Um, and just remember that when you're putting those in, um, that you will have to do it in respect to when they were paid. Um, so when you paid uh, the, um, uh, or, or when that employee was paid those things, and, and um, it's, not, it's not in respect to when it was earned. So that's something that I've been hearing a lot of issues about, and I know it's a little bit technical, um, but hopefully that'll help you with that. And then also just as a reminder, uh, the same member reminded me about the PD-27 form, which is the form that you have to uh, fill out if you were eligible to the 10% wage subsidy, the, the temporary um, sub subsidy, employee subsidy. Um, so that is something that you do have to fill out even if you did not receive the 10% the um, wage subsidy, if you were eligible to it, um, you still have to fill this out. Um, so just as a note, that is something you'll have to do. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you wanna ask, or if we wanna throw any other questions, but otherwise I'll just I think you can wrap you. us up and, and, okay. and you're, you're raising some good questions that speak exactly to why we're gonna have a tax accountant on us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. It'll be good. Um, but yeah, I guess as as a, as a closing remark, thank you guys so much for this year. Thank you for being vulnerable with us. Thank you for sharing your stories with us and, and letting us be your vo voice during this time. Um, I, I know I've been on the phones with many of you and these these times have been beyond difficult so i hope you'll be able to take a deep breath and remember you guys are resilient and you can move forwards into the new year and and we at cfib are cheering you on um and with that i hope during the holidays you'll continue to support your your communities be kind to yourselves and stay safe and stay sane thanks rachel Brendan, um, what about you? Uh, any concluding remarks and any last questions you want to sneak in? I'll keep the questions short because we're, we're, you know, I do want to respect people's time. Thanks, Rachel, for taking my time. No, I'm just joking. Um, just, just a couple words. Um, the first is just to reiterate from uh, what Laura said is that we are working through Christmas. I mean, not not actually Christmas Day. The only days we're off is the 25th and the 1st. So if you're if you're having issues, you still have to run your business. If you're feeling lonely, give us a call. We do have business resource counselors on staff, and we get a little lonely too sometimes. So don't hesitate to reach out. It is one of those uh, weird Christmases where in a lot of places you're not allowed to even gather with family, extended family. So please consider us your extended family for the holidays, and uh, we are always happy to talk to you. And um, the other thing as well is that I was getting a lot of questions about those businesses who are still falling through the gaps, like new businesses, uh, seasonal businesses, and we've not forgotten about you. CFIB is working so hard uh, to have you included under those big three programs, and uh, we'll continue to work through the end of this year and into the new year, and uh, just know that you're still top of mind for us, so just never hesitate to reach out with your story. Every story we get adds, uh, adds fuel to the fire. So. 
Uh, I wish everybody happy holidays. And uh, like I say, we're here regardless. So just has, don't hesitate to reach out to us if you need us. Thanks so much, Brendan. And Brendan, you just do awesome work. So on behalf of the webinar participants, maybe I'll, I'll just give a little shout out to you. You and Rachel both have been just incredible through this. Like I can't believe how many calls you've dealt with and the kinds of feedback we've gotten on the great work that, that you do. And uh, so um, you're a fantastic part of the part of the team, both of you. Corinne, I'm gonna go to you. I feel really sad, actually, that we have to say goodbye to the webinars for 20. That was one of the highlights of 2020 for me, with these webinars. I'll go to you. And I know you've Yeah, they absolutely have been. And thank you, everybody, once again, um, for joining us as we come to the end of a very challenging year. Um, and uh, I think I can't really say much more than what my colleagues have already said. Um, the stories we hear constantly inspire and motivate us to continue to work and push and ask and cajole and try to get government to make changes that are going to help um, you know as many businesses basically possibly can help and I'm always I'm always amazed at how many of you are still um, out there doing everything you can to keep your business afloat and it's incredibly uh, admirable and so I just um, I am in, I'm constantly humbled by the incredible um, stories that we hear uh, from many folks out there and of course the folks on this particular webinar as Laura said this has been a highlight of uh, my year too um, we've had a few laughs uh, we hopefully have been able to provide you with some good information and you have provided me with invaluable insight into what is needed in order to push government to move forward with the things that are necessary right now. Well, it's the end of the year. It's not the end of the webinar. And we look forward to seeing you um, in the new year or hearing from you in the new year. And uh, I do want to wish you all a very restful, very safe, and hopefully a few laughs um, over the Christmas holidays and uh, or whatever it is that you celebrate over the holidays over the next couple of weeks. Thanks. Thanks, Corinne. And I guess I'll just come in behind everyone to say that, uh, to come in behind Brendan to say we're here, we are here during the holidays, so don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I'll come in behind Rachel to say it's been a great privilege um, for us to um, be part of this community um, that, that we've uh, created. I mean, it really, um, and the vulnerability, and I think also, you know, Corinne and I have talked about this, how challenging it is when we don't have all the answers. And I really appreciate how patient everyone's been with, with that when we don't have the answers um, and how helpful you've been in, you know, weighing in with some of what you know and helping us all kind of get there together. Um, you know, it's tempting sometimes when people don't have the answers you need or make mistakes. We occasionally have made mistakes on these webinars where we've had to go back and say to you, sorry, we got that wrong last Last week and you guys have been so um, great about that and you know we haven't had any sort of what you crazy idiots like you don't know what you're talking about we haven't had any of that from our members and we really appreciate that because you know as you can probably see we're working we're working pretty hard uh, to um, somebody said gave me some advice once on on, on dealing with difficult situations and um, you know sometimes the best language is to say it sucks, but you can handle it. And I thought that's so apropos of 2020 and what Corinne said, you're our heroes for, for dealing with just a situation that absolutely sucks. I don't know if collectively we've ever been so happy to say goodbye to a year as we are with 2021. It sucks. Um, but but we're all handling it and you guys are handling it amazingly well and you are our heroes. We are here for you. Um, lean on some of those quotes and that holiday advice. It is a, this is a perfect time of year to sort of be a little bit nostalgic about the past, be courageous about the present and be hopeful uh, for the for the future. I think that that just captures it so well. And I wish for you as Corinne does that some laughter, some joy, um, and some um, spirit of love that this that this season brings out in everyone. Really look forward to connecting again in 2021. Thank you again for helping us create such a great uh, community, and we look forward to webinar number 37 um, in the second week in January. And with that, we'll uh, say goodbye to the weekly webinars for 2021. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs>